Hello, Brentwood Church family. Thank you for being with us tonight. And for those joining us from the Nashville area and other parts around the world, we are especially thankful that you're able to be here with us tonight. My name is Chris Walker. I'm one of the deacons here at the Brentwood Church, and I'd like to welcome you to week one of our 2020 summer series. Our theme for the summer series this year is At His Feet, the Parables of Jesus. Every Wednesday night this summer at 7 p.m., we'll have a guest speaker dive into one of the many practical lessons that Jesus gave to his followers. And tonight for our first lesson, we're very excited to have Shane Scott uh, join us. Shane has joined us for our summer series for many years, and we're so glad he can be back with us again this year. Shane is from the Valrico Congregation in Valrico, Florida, and we'll share a lesson tonight from Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46 on the parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great value. So at this time, we'll turn things over to Shane. It is great to be back with you guys, even though it is online instead of in person. I really miss getting to actually visit with you all. The only positive to this situation is, as I recall, the pulpit there is pretty hot to preach in. So at least here, preaching from the comfort of my own home with the air conditioner turned very cool, Hopefully I won't perspire as much as I usually sweat when I'm there with you in person. But I do miss getting to see you, and I look forward to circumstances being such that we can be together in person again. The theme of Jesus' preaching, according to the Gospel of Matthew, is very simple. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But Jesus not only preached sermons about the coming of the kingdom, he also told stories. Those stories are called parables. And I'd like to study two of those stories with you tonight. They're found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46, if you'd like to read with me. Matthew 13, 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like hidden treasure in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, to get the most out of these parables, here's what I would like to do in this lesson. First of all, I'd like to talk with you a little bit about what the kingdom of heaven is. And then I want to go back and look at these two small stories in brief detail. And then I want to draw some applications out of these stories about the kingdom that our Lord told. But first of all, when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, what exactly are we describing? Usually in English, when we use the word kingdom, we are referring to a realm or a territory over which a monarch reigns. So the United Kingdom, for example, is England and Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. But in Scripture, the word kingdom, although it can be used to describe a realm or a territory, first and foremost refers to the reign of the king, the royal power and authority and sovereignty of a king. You can see that really easily in the Lord's Prayer. Think about the opening words. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. You see how your kingdom come is parallel to your will be done. For God's kingdom to come is for God's will to be done, for his authority to be recognized, to be in subjection to his sovereignty. So when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, primarily we are talking about the reign of God. Now, who is subject to the reign of God? Well, since God made the whole world, the entire world is subject to his kingship. Here's how David expressed it in a prayer he made in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, in verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. God is the king because God is the creator. And we as human beings bear a special relationship to him. We're made in his image and in his likeness. In the ancient world, kings would place statues of themselves around their empire 
which were designed to represent and extend their authority. So when Genesis tells us that God made human beings in his image and after his likeness, it's the Bible's way of saying that God intends for human beings to serve the function of those statues. It's just that we are living and breathing and walking and talking statues designed to reflect and represent the authority of the king. That's why in Genesis 1, right after the text says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, the text goes on to say, and let them have dominion. So we are made to reign with the heavenly king, to work for the king. In other words, we as human beings were made to share with God in a relationship of life and work and love. But instead, we rebelled against the king. We subverted his authority rather than submitting to his authority. And at every stage of the Bible story, you can see this. You can see it in all humanity from the time of Adam. You can see it in all Israel from the time of Abraham and Moses. You can see it in the kings of David from the time of the great shepherd king himself. But when Jesus came in his ministry, he came announcing, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That God's kingdom was coming, that God was about to make things right as king, to recapture those who belong to his kingdom. And that would be done through his point man, the Lord's anointed, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to prove that he was the Lord's anointed one and the spearhead of the coming kingdom of God, Jesus performed signs and wonders which discredited the ultimate leader of all cosmic rebellion against the king, which is, of course, Satan. In fact, if you look at the chapter just before the one that contains our parables, in Matthew chapter 12, you may recall the debate that took place when the Pharisees tried to undermine the miracles of Jesus, like his miracles of exorcism, casting out demons, by accusing him of doing so by the power of Satan. You remember what Jesus said to them, right? In Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that his miracles were a demonstration that he was God's special agent, special royal representative to herald the good news of the coming age of the kingdom of God. You might say that the theme of Jesus' ministry was the empire strikes back, except unlike in the movies in which the bad guys are winning, in this case, it's the good guys. It is the greatest source of good of all, and that is God. And what a blessing it is then for those whom Jesus heals and those from whom he casts out demons to be liberated from the tyranny of such an evil overlord and to be set free to share in the life and love of God's reign. And what the Bible teaches is the story of the kingdom of God has both a present dimension, but also a future dimension. Um, we are right about the time of year when you're going to see remembrances of the D-Day invasion in June in 1944. But of course, although that was the decisive victory, that wasn't the ultimate victory. That came almost a year later with Victory in Europe Day for the European Theater, and then later in August in Japan for the Pacific Theater. My point is that even though Jesus has come and his kingdom is a present reality, and even though in his death and resurrection Jesus has won the decisive victory, there is yet a final victory to win. There is yet a final aspect of the kingdom of God to be realized. It's what Paul speaks of in the great resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians 15, when he says that Jesus must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
And when that time comes, when that glorious future arrives, when we share in the reign in Christ and God is all in all, as Paul says, then the kingdom of heaven will mean eternal life and love and joy. So with that background in mind, let's take a look now in more close detail at these two stories that Jesus tells here in Matthew chapter 13. Verse 44. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven, and let me just pause here. Often in Matthew, instead of saying the kingdom of God, he will say the kingdom of heaven. But the phrases mean the same thing. When he says the kingdom of God, he's highlighting the one who reigns, which is God. And when he says the kingdom of heaven, he's placing the emphasis on the otherworldly nature of that reign. In other words, God's kingdom is not like a political or military power of our day and time. It's the reign of the heavenly king. So going on in verse 44, he says, It's like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. If you're like me, this sounds a little odd. I mean, <clears throat> I know that dogs go bury things in the ground, but I don't normally think of people burying treasures. But actually, in the ancient world, this was quite common. They didn't have the developed banking system that we do. You may recall in the story of the, the parable of the talents that the one talent man buries his talent. And that's because in the ancient world, if you wanted to store something and keep it safe, you went outside and you dug a hole, you found a, a cave somewhere and you buried it. You, you know of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were actually... Uh, hidden away in, as treasures in the caves in, in Qumran, down the Dead Sea area in Israel, because of the impending Roman invasion. So this was actually something quite common in ancient times, so much so that there were a lot of stories uh, about peasants finding hidden treasure. It, this is sort of the ancient equivalent of a story about a man named Jed, a poor mountaineer who barely kept his family fed, Except instead of finding hidden treasure, he found oil, but it would be kind of the same concept. E even today, if you just go on Google, you can find examples of people finding uh, relatively ancient treasures that have been hidden, uh, just like the man in this story. So it's a story that people of Jesus' day could relate to, and we can relate to as well. <clears throat> Now, it doesn't seem as if the man who finds this owns the field because he plans to buy it from the owner of the field. Uh, maybe if we tried to fill in some backstory details, maybe he's a hired hand out working the field. Maybe he's a sojourner who just happened to be crossing that part of the territory only to stumble across this treasure. And that's what Jesus focuses on. In fact, he goes on to say this at the end of verse 44. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. This inevitably leads to questions uh, like, where did he have enough stuff to go and to sell it to buy this field? Was it ethical for him to find a treasure, not tell the owner of the field, buy the field, and then take the treasure? Um, if it makes you feel any better, most likely the owner of the field is not the one who buried the treasure or else he would have gotten it out before he sold the field to the man. And, you know, quite honestly, we don't want to overpress all of these little ancillary details in the stories that Jesus tells. People who want to fixate in, on those details uh, remind me of my granny, who whenever I would watch Popeye cartoons, would always want to know, after he ate the spinach, what happened to the can. Well, don't focus on those things. Focus instead on what the text draws our attention to. And what it tells us is two things. First of all, he sold all that he had. This treasure was so vi valuable, he was willing to part with everything he owned. How much he had is really irrelevant. Whatever it was, 100% of it was sold so that he could get this treasure. He sold it all. And a second detail is he did so in his joy. It says in the English Standard Version. Uh, the New American Standard says, from joy over it. It must have been some treasure for this man to immediately and completely reorder all of his priorities, part with everything that he cherished, and do so enthusiastically. The other parable is different in some ways, but similar 
in its overall point. Verse 45 says again, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Pearls were a more highly valued commodity in the ancient world than in our own time, although they're certainly still valuable. If we were to swap out a commodity to be sort of representative, we might think in terms of diamonds. We do know that ancient reports describe the discovery of pearls that would have been worth you know, tens of millions of dollars of our own currency. Uh, some of you may be collectors of different kinds. When I was a young man, I know there was a big... Um, surge in collecting baseball cards. Maybe some of you were a part of that. Maybe some of you collect stamps or fine china. So you can just think of in those collections, whatever the most valuable piece would be to find. Now, unlike the man in the first parable, this man is deliberately and intentionally searching for what he finds. And after seeking, he does find it. In verse 46, Jesus says, Who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. He may have been different from the first man in terms of his pursuit of what he finds. But when he finds it, he responds exactly the same way as the other man. He sold all that he had to buy it. And as a jewel merchant, I would imagine that he had amassed quite a fortune. But he was willing to sell out for the very same reason as the man in the field. 100% in order to obtain the pearl of great price or value. So there you have two brief stories about the kingdom. What lessons would Jesus want us to draw from these stories? First of all, the kingdom of heaven is worth more than anything else. That is, to those who know how to properly appraise its value. In the previous section of parables, Jesus has already described those who, who fell for counterfeit riches. In the parable of the sower, he describes the thorny soil in verse 22 as, For what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But the men in the stories we're studying tonight immediately grasp that the treasure they found was inestimably greater than all that they had. Their value structure was completely turned upside down. Kind of like Paul's. You remember what he says in Philippians chapter 3? Whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. You know, at least the man in the field and the merchant thought that what they had was of some value because they gathered it up to sell it. Paul says that what he once thought was a source of gain and profit, what was once an asset, was loss. It was actually a liability. It was bankrupting him spiritually. All of the pride he had in his fleshly achievements as a Pharisee of Pharisees, all of the murder and mayhem he caused as a persecutor was sapping him of value. But when he found Jesus Christ, he says this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. If we are to embrace the kingdom of heaven, the reign of God, we must see that its worth is more than anything else. It's priceless. And if we are not seeking it, then we are seeking infinitely too little. C.S. Lewis one time said, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Jesus is calling us to give up the mud pies of the world for the eternal life and love and glory of the kingdom of heaven. But to do so, we also need to understand, as these parables teach, that the kingdom of heaven costs us everything we have. Both men in these stories knew that the value of what they could obtain was of such a magnitude 
that everything they had was expendable. The man in the field sold all that he had to obtain the treasure. The merchant sold all that he had to acquire the pearl. God doesn't offer us something for nothing. God offers us something for everything. It just so happens that his something is infinitely greater than our everything. The point here is not that we have to buy or earn our way into the kingdom of heaven. That's impossible. The point is, its value is far beyond whatever we could merit or deserve. Instead, the point is to truly place ourselves under the reign of God means that there is no part of our lives that can be held on reserve from God for us to remain in charge of. To give everything to the kingdom of God for the kingdom of heaven means that because God is king everywhere and at all times, we don't intend to parcel ourselves out to him in fractions. This king, to be king and to be submitted to, requires and deserves absolute submission. We have to sell out completely. I was visiting with a family recently who just downsized from about a 3,000 square foot home to about a 2,000 square foot home. And, and we were commiserating about how difficult it is to let go of stuff when you have to sell it. I, I was, I'm very sentimental when Christy and I moved down to Florida and we were going to have to downsize. Um, I didn't want to let go of a lot of stuff. Now, Christy, on the other hand, she was just tossing things out after. I'm just glad she kept me when we made the move. And that, of course, is difficult just moving from one house to another. Jesus asks us to let go of everything to come to his kingdom. And for a lot of persons, like the man described over in Matthew 19, who we call the rich young ruler, the price was too high. You remember this story. The, the young man comes to Jesus, asks what he must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus says, keep the commandments, and he begins to list them. You shall not murder you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor father and mother, love your neighbors yourself. And the young man says, all these I've kept up, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And Come, follow me. Now, Jesus doesn't ask everyone he encounters to sell everything that they have. But did you notice that when Jesus listed all of the commands, the thou shalt not commands, there was one command conspicuously absent. It's the one thing the young man lacked. You shall not covet. This young man has come upon a treasure, the greatest treasure of all. And now he has to decide, will he be willing, like the man in the field, to sell all that he has to obtain this treasure? And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. To the young man, this seemed like too high a price to pay. But you understand, we just read about a man who has made the worst deal possible a catastrophically bad deal. Jesus wasn't asking him to make a disinterested vow of poverty. He offered him treasure in heaven. But there was a corner of his heart he refused to give to God. You see, the man in the field and the merchant knew a good deal when they saw it. And they knew that whatever they had to give up, even if it cost everything, was worth to obtain this treasure. When Jesus says that we must deny ourselves and take up our cross to follow him, just remember that journey doesn't end at the cross. We are following Jesus into the glory of the eternal kingdom. And because the kingdom of heaven is more valuable than anything, it's worth giving up everything. Which is what both of these men did. Because as different as they are, they both found the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven can be found by anyone. Now, these two discoveries are so different on the surface. Uh, the first man stumbles across his treasure. It reminds me of the way the jailer found the kingdom of heaven. You know his story in Acts 16. Startled by an earthquake at midnight, 
panic that prisoners under his charge may have escaped, on the verge of suicide, desperately asking, what must I do to be saved, only to hear words as unexpected as stumbling on a treasure in a field. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. He knew a good deal when he saw it. Within the hour, he and his household believed and were baptized. And just like the man who found the treasure in the field and sold all that he had, he did so with joy. And the jailer rejoiced along with his household that he had believed in God. Now, on the other hand, the merchant had been in search of fine pearls. He was diligently seeking, just like the Ethiopian nobleman who had traveled from his home at what was considered in the ancient world the end of the earth to come to Jerusalem to worship, and was still searching and seeking as he poured over the scroll of Isaiah on his way back home. And the Lord sent him Philip, and before long he believed and he was baptized, and like the jailer, he also went on his way rejoicing. The jailer and the eunuch were as different as two people could be, except they both realized the kingdom of heaven meant everything. And they both gave themselves completely. And they both did so, rejoicing. Now, you may have stumbled upon this lesson by accident. Or maybe you are an earnest seeker. Or maybe... Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but you're having second thoughts, wondering whether the commitment you made some time ago is really worth it. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ told these stories to invite you and to reassure you that what he offers you is priceless. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to turn back and defeat the powers of evil and death and sin and to take his place at your right hand to reign. And thank you, Father, for drawing us, inviting us, for creating us to reign as your representatives made in your image. Thank you for forgiving us for our, our cosmic treason and turning from you. And thank you, Father, for the grace and mercy of our great King and Liberator, Jesus who by his death and resurrection has made us free and now has once again restored our place in your kingdom. And Father, thank you for the life and work and love that we share now. And thank you, Father, for the promise of future and final victory when we are raised to new life and when we enjoy life and love with you in your eternal kingdom of glory forever. It's what we long for, Father. It's what means everything to us. Help us to keep our hearts set on it. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Shane, as always, for an excellent lesson. It's such a powerful and practical reminder about the value of the kingdom of heaven and gives us all a lot to think about. If you're in the Brentwood or Franklin or South Nashville area, we'd love for you to join us in person if you're able at 208 Granny White Pike in Brentwood, Tennessee, where we'll meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. You can also join us online for lessons each week on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. And for links to all of our message, messages throughout the summer, you can visit us at BrentwoodChurch.com. Thank you again for being with us tonight. See you back here next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. where we'll continue our summer series studying the parables of Jesus. Good night and may God bless you all.